Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to this public event today. I am, uh, it is my very great pleasure and my honor to introduce to you Sam Potolicchio. He will be talking about the US election, how it happened and what it was. Uh, Sam Potolicchio is Director of Global and Customer Education at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. And he also serves as the, uh, the, um, as the department chairman and distinguished professor in political and social communications at the School of Public Policy at the Russian Presidential Academy. Also, he serves as the president of Preparing Global Leaders Forum, a leadership training program for rising leaders from over 100 uh, countries. Uh, Sam is, uh, was named one of America's best professors by the Princeton Review, the only one in his field, and the future leader of American higher education by the Association of Colleges and Universities. He has delivered uh, lectures in over 75 countries. He's also senior advisor to high-ranking officials around the globe and is currently the director and academic designer of the first English language program on global governance and leadership in the Russian Federation. He um, is a visiting professor at New York University and an official lecturer at, the, uh, lecturer at the Library of Congress for OWLC, an international leadership program at the, of the United States, States Congress. So, Again, welcome, Sam. It is a pleasure to have you here, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I am blushing. It's also difficult for me to be here where it's 80 degrees. I was just in Moscow where it was not 80 degrees, so I'm getting used to the, the warmth here. I'm hoping that this will be the last time that I talk about the election. Uh, I can retire, I can drop the mic, I can say Sam's out after this talk. It's a pleasure to be back here in Doha. Uh, I always love the, the hospitality here and the familiar faces. And I have to say this <clears throat> election also marked the one year anniversary of my last lecture here on campus. On November 26, 2015, uh, two professor friends of mine here arranged, arranged a lecture for me on the presidential election. This was before the Republicans and the Democrats had coalesced uh, around Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And the proposed title that I gave to the office was Hillary will not win the election. And it was changed to Hillary will struggle to win because people feared that I would have great embarrassment if I came back here a year later. Uh, this is not an I told you so uh, lecture, but I want to examine the reasons for why what happened happened. When I gave that lecture, I started it off by playing three songs. The first song was by the former Massachusetts governor, Mitt Romney, singing America the Beautiful in the most off-key way that you can imagine. In fact, it probably should be illegal for him to even sing in the showers. And the next two songs were by President Obama, singing I'm So In Love With You by Al Green and then Sweet Home Chicago. And the performance was so impressive at the Sweet Home Chicago venue at the White House, Mick Jagger, the lead singer of the Rolling Stones, expressed his astonishment. And I think now we're all looking to see whether or not President Obama's next job will be as a top recording artist mogul if Jay-Z and Beyonce and One Direction and Justin Bieber have competition. And the point that I made was that in 2012, if you were a political scientist and you looked at different variables, you may predict that Mitt Romney would have won the election. Because the American people, the most important issue to them in 2012 was the economy. And they favored Mitt Romney over Barack Obama and who could handle the economy more effectively, 53 to 45. Now you might not think that's a big gap, but in American presidential electoral politics, that's a complete landslide. You just saw a president elected with 46% of the vote. In 2012, Obama got 51%. In 2008, Obama got 53%. In 2004, Bush got 51%. In 2000, he got 48. Clinton got 49 and 43%. So to get 53% of the American people to think you're better on a certain issue is a big victory. Secondly, the American people also agreed with Mitt Romney more on the issues. He was closer to the average ideological preference of the median voter in the United States. So why does he lose the election? 
My argument was he lost the election because he lost the most important question in American presidential politics, which is who do you like more? And he lost this question 56 to 27. Now let me take two different presidential elections, two different incumbent presidents of two different parties running for re-election. 2004, George W. Bush, the Republican running for re-election, 2012, Barack Obama. In both cases, these two incumbent presidents had 49% personal approval ratings. The country thought we were on the right track in both cases at 43%. In both cases, they were going up against awkward Massachusetts politicians worth a quarter billion dollars. John Kerry, who was the former senator from Massachusetts, was the nominee, and Mitt Romney for the Republicans in 2012. In both cases, Bush and Obama won the who do you like more question, 56 to 27 and they both won 51% of the vote in their re-elections. And this was my primary argument for why I thought it would be almost impossible at the time for Hillary Clinton to win the presidential election, is because she was not gonna beat any of those prime time Republican candidates on who do you like more. Before I get into why she lost and why Trump won, I wanna puncture three myths about this presidential election. The first one is that the Democrats lost big. I don't agree with that, not just because Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by almost three million votes, but also if you look even at the House of Representatives, they picked up seven seats and they only lost the popular vote in the House of Representatives, 49 to 48, but they actually improved on their performance in the 2014 congressional elections by 2.5% while the Republicans got 2.1% worse. If you look at the United States Senate, the Democrats again picked up more seats than the Republicans, they picked up two seats, and they won the popular vote in the Senate by almost 11 percentage points. They did 9.3% better than the 2014 senatorial elections, while the Republicans did almost 10 points worse. Second myth is that there wasn't enthusiasm that people didn't turn out to vote. I hear people are saying this, why didn't the people who were marching in Washington and other cities around the world turn out to vote? What was the voter turnout compared to historic elections in the United States this time around? How does it compare? What percentage do you think turned out to vote in 2016? Just over 60%. And this is among the highest turnout all the way back to 1968. It compares favorably to the historic election of Barack Obama in 2008, where the voter turnout was 61.6%, and it was actually three points higher than Obama's re-election victory in 2012. The third myth that I want to puncture is that this election was determined because it was a white, old, uneducated, and male electorate. It's simply not true. It was less white, it was younger, and it was more educated than any election we've had in our history. In 2012, 72% of the electorate was white. In this election, it was 70%. In 2012, 19% of the electorate was considered young. In this election, it was 20%. 2012, 16% was considered old. This election, it was 15%. College educated, at least with some college. In 2012, it was 47% and in 2016, 15%. And it was almost equally male at 47.5% in 2012 versus 48% in 2016. Okay, so we've punctured the myths. Why did Trump win? What were the reasons for his stunning success? I think what could be the most surprising political story in American presidential history. I would be confident making that claim and be willing to defend that. First. The voters wanted change. When you go to the voting booth and you leave, sometimes you may be a participant in an exit poll and they ask you questions, demographic questions, why you voted a certain way. And when asked what was the most important characteristic you were looking for in your next president, 15% of people said is I want a president who cares about me and about the issues that are close to me. And Hillary Clinton won these voters by 23%. 
that was the fourth most important reason given. The third most important reason was judgment. Someone who was going to make the best decisions. Hillary Clinton wins this by 40 percentage points. The second most important characteristic, experience. 21% of Americans said that this was the most important for them. And Hillary Clinton wins this by 82 percentage points. But the problem for Hillary Clinton in this election was the most important characteristic was someone who represents change. 39% of Americans, almost twice as many Americans as the second most important characteristic. And Donald Trump wins this by almost 70 percentage points. Second reason why Trump wins, and this may be because of his iconoclastic issue straddling. Is he a Republican? Is he not a Republican? He's a populist. Him and Bernie Sanders had overlap on issues, particularly when it came to trade. What exactly is he? Well, he did enough movement on this spectrum from right to left that it may have created lots of ambiguity on the issues for American voters. In fact, American voters favored him on economic issues, 46% to 42%. They favored him on security issues, 45% to 44%. On job growth issues, 46% to 40%. Additionally, when it comes to the policy issues, just several weeks before the election, New Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act rates became noticeable for people, the spikes in those rates by almost 25% in some cases. And that led lots of people to disapprove of Obamacare, a 12% movement on this issue. At the time of the election, 58% of people wanted Obamacare either significantly altered or completely repealed. The third reason why I think Trump won he didn't have a normal campaign staff, truly an amateur politician, even when it comes to the infrastructure of field offices and the people that are in his inner circle. Hillary Clinton had upwards of four times as many field offices, four times as many staffers, had an understanding of when to buy media so you would receive discounted rates. But Trump had a huge advantage when it came to outside spending when it came to either interest groups or super PACs. He received $70 more million dollars than Hillary Clinton. Now this is offset by the fact that Hillary Clinton's campaign infrastructure raised a lot more money than Donald Trump. So it's almost a wash when it comes to that. But what was the big advantage Donald Trump had? We're now living in this celebrity era. This is now the first celebrity apprentice president that we've had. And he wins when it comes to free media by over $2 billion. Studies show that he received about $5.6 billion in free media, where Hillary Clinton received about $3.5 billion. Now, the one caveat that I want to include here is that he had about a $1.9 billion advantage through the primaries. So his advantage in the general election when he went head-to-head -head with Hillary Clinton was only $200 million. But as you can see, that still represents a significant advantage when campaigns typically only spend up to a billion dollars. I want to say only spend up to a billion dollars. I remember in 2012, I was on a panel where people were bemoaning how much money was involved in politics, and I made a provocative comment saying we spend $70 billion a year in soda advertising, and we're only spending one to two point billion dollars a year when it comes to our presidential campaigns. The priorities are out of whack here. And so a $200 million advantage in the general election on free media can make a significant difference when only, as I put in scare quotes, a billion dollars is being spent on each side. The fourth, and this has recently come up in the news just as I was boarding my flight in Washington, D.C. to come uh, to Doha. Some of you may have heard the counselor to the president defend the president's press secretary's unbelievable performance trying to debate the crowd size at the inauguration. I'm really glad tonight Sean Spicer has said that my crowd size is 38,000 people. <laughs> and her defense was, we're going to present to you alternative facts. And if you remembered, she made a comment to her interrogator, Chuck Todd, where she said, your approval rating is only 14%. Now, this was an instructive comment because 
one of the prime reasons for why Donald Trump was able to pull this off is it didn't really matter what happened if people didn't have trust in the messenger. In 1997, among Democrats, 64% of Democrats had a great deal or a fair amount of trust in the national news media, 64%. That number today is 51%. Among independents in 1997, 53%. And now today, that is 30%, a drop of 23 percentage points. But why is that 14% number important? In 1997, 46% of Republicans had a great deal or fair amount of trust in the media, and today that's 14%. That's the 14% that she's talking about. So no matter what happens, even if you're Hillary Clinton and your negative ads are just Donald Trump's own words, if you're turning your voters and your constituencies and the people that you're trying to persuade against the media, when that bad news is reported, it doesn't really have the same impact. The fifth reason why he wins is you all know this surprising collapse of the blue wall when it comes to the Electoral College and his victories in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania. Surprising. In fact, so much so that the Clinton campaign didn't put lots of resources in there, as many visits as they thought. They thought it was, this was on autopilot. So why does he win those states? Well, if you look at the electorate in these specific states, they tend to be more white male without college degree and more white Catholic. Donald Trump in these states wins the white male without a college degree by almost 40 percentage points. This is a 16 point improvement over Mitt Romney in 2012. He wins the white Catholic vote by 23 points over Hillary Clinton. This is a six percentage point improvement over Mitt Romney in 2012. Right? This can explain that shift of three to four percentage points is just the difference in his performance compared to Mitt Romney. Okay, so these are five explanations on Donald Trump's ledger. Let's talk now about Hillary Clinton. Five reasons why she loses. First, the Obama coalition does not perform as well for her as it did for Obama. You would expect that. Obviously, it's Obama's coalition. But the drop-off was more significant than people expected. She did eight points worse among Latinos, 11 points worse among Asians, five points worse among the young, the millennial generation, seven points worse among African Americans. But the most surprising number for me and she struggled with this during the Democratic campaign against Bernie Sanders, is that she did seven points worse among unmarried women. So someone who is trying to be the first female president of the United States of America has a drop off from the previous vote of a Democratic nominee by seven percentage points. Second reason why she loses. When you ask for people's vote, when you say, I want to be president of the United States, the two most important qualities that you need to establish with your electorate, are you smart enough to do the job? And can you be trusted to do the job? Now, Hillary Clinton is going to pass the competence test. The Republicans were trying to undermine this with her judgment as Secretary of State, with her performance as either First Lady or as Senator, but the major issue for Hillary Clinton was the baggage that she had that undermined her trustworthiness. 61% of Americans judged Hillary Clinton not to be honest and trustworthy. That is a staggering statistic. And what's been interesting for me, whether or not it's in the classroom in Washington, D.C., or it's battling the biggest fans of Donald Trump in the world, my students in Moscow, Russia, I think I might be a unique messenger today because as the professor mentioned in her kind introduction, uh, I work at a university that's technically under the administration of the Kremlin. Uh, this, many people joke, as he did on Saturday Night Live through character, uh, this was the most expensive thing Russians bought in their history, so they'll treat us well. What is it about Hillary Clinton that you find so dishonest where you can't trust her? And what's interesting in the response was it's typically one or two words, and then when you try to prod them, you know, they'll say emails, or they'll say Goldman Sachs, or they'll say 
whitewater. And then, you, well, what about the emails? What about the speech fees or the Clinton Foundation and taking money from foreign governments? And they can't really answer that. The third reason, no third terms. The instinctive movement against monarchy in the United States. If you look at the Constitution, there are seven articles to the US Constitution. The second article is the one that spells out the executive branch. And in that article, the word presidency is not even used as an institution. There was a huge debate in the United States about how powerful our executive should be. What's the most important document in the United States? Do you know? So you would say the Constitution. This is the most popular answer I get. But it's actually the Declaration of Independence. This is why we are a country. But this is where the American creed of equality of opportunity is announced, this birthright. Who do we write the Declaration of Independence against? A king. And so on one hand, we needed a national unifying figure as a poor and insecure country that just got its freedom. But on the other hand, we don't want to have another king. And there were debates when you're putting together the Constitution about where on that continuum the president should be. And who solves this problem for the United States? I live in the city named after him. George Washington, the first president. And what was interesting was after two elected terms, nothing in the Constitution introduced anything with term limitations. Four-year term of office, and then you run for election again. But there was no prevention of whether or not you could run for a third or fourth term. Nobody's taken down George Washington. That's not going to happen. But after two elected terms, what does George Washington do? He says, that's enough for me. I'm out. And what's interesting, if you look at American presidential history, is almost every second term president, it's an unwritten rule, but they abide by it. After two terms, I'm out. And what do we do when we had someone who won four elections, who served just over three terms, died shortly into his 12th year of office, just into his 13th year of office? Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the early 1940s. We changed the Constitution to say George Washington got it right. That's it for Obama. Bill Clinton almost became the first first husband. No more president for him. George Bush can't be president again. And it's the same case when it comes to electoral politics. There have been seven presidents since FDR who have either been filling out the party's second term, Johnson comes to mind here, or who themselves are finishing their own elected second term. Seven presidents, Truman, Eisenhower, Johnson, Reagan, Clinton, Bush, and now Obama. How many times has the successor won the presidency? Of those seven, how many third terms have been given? to a political party. Just one, George H.W. Bush succeeding Ronald Reagan. And if you examine the election results there, that was essentially because his opponent imploded, because his opponent at one point, and there's a Saturday Night Live sketch that I commend to all of you that, where he says, how am I losing to this guy? At one point, he was winning by 17 percentage points in the Gallup poll. So it was a comeback victory for George H.W. Bush. And in several of those elections, the incumbent president, while their successor was trying to win the election, had stratospheric approval ratings, at least by American standards. Eisenhower's successor, who was Eisenhower's successor? Who was his vice president? Richard Nixon, who later would become president, but he lost that election to Kennedy. Eisenhower had a 58% approval rating at the time of the election. Bill Clinton, his successor being Al Gore, I know he did win the popular vote. Bill Clinton had a 57% approval rating. And in this last election, even though he ended up leaving office with a 60% approval rating, on November 8th, Barack Obama had a 56% approval rating. And his successor, who not only the first lady and the president campaigned harder in history than any lame duck president or lame duck first lady, was not able to win. That there is this instinct against a third term in the United States. It was an uphill battle. We talk about this being a stunning victory for Donald Trump. This was the Republicans' election to lose. And in fact, if you just go by the popular vote, Donald Trump was probably the worst political performer in history. So we're selling this as just this stunning political performance. But that's because of what Donald Trump said and how he behaved and the way that people judge his temperament. 
that a Republican, just a generic Republican candidate, probably should have won this election between four and six percentage points. And Donald Trump actually lost by just over two. So you could make the argument he did six to eight points worse than just the average candidate would have done. The fourth reason why Hillary Clinton loses is message clarity. And I could do this in this room right now. I could ask you, what was Hillary's message? What would you say? Okay, so you're going right off the bumper sticker. <laughs> and then if I asked you the follow-up, what does that mean? Right. It's more difficult, but you might not have had the only answer. If I ask you what Donald Trump's slogan is or message is, what would you say? Uh, one of the recent winners of the Nobel Prize, scholar at Princeton, Angus Deaton, interesting study uh, that came out that he... Uh, co-authored with another eminent uh, professor at Princeton, looked at mortality rates. And every single demographic group in the United States has been living longer over the last several decades. This is something I think we could expect with nutritional advances, with improvement in healthcare offerings, except one demographic. What demographic is that? White males without a college degree. They're actually living a little bit less than they were several decades ago. What could the explanation be for that? It's interesting now, living in Russia, I'm a taxpayer in the United States, a taxpayer in the Russian Federation, and you saw this happen in 1998 in Russia with the ruble default, right, or the breakup of the Soviet Union, is you lose status, right? you don't have the college degree, and you're going to get lost in that knowledge economy. And it could be tied with race, too, as well, with uh, racial advancements and civil rights is that you don't feel you're on the top of the pecking order, you've now lost that comparative status, and what do you end up doing? You drug and drink yourself to death. Happened in Russia, evidence is coming out that at least with a certain demographic, it's happening in the United States. The fifth reason, the spoilers. What do I mean by the spoilers? The presence of the third party. Now you can make the argument that the third party on the liberal side, that would be represented by Jill Stein, received less votes than the third party on the more conservative side, represented by the libertarian candidate, Gary Johnson, who happened to be a two-term Republican governor of New Mexico, and his running mate, William Weld, was a Republican governor of Massachusetts. But if you look at the evidence, many people argue that the libertarian ticket, because it drew so heavily from millennials, may have actually taken away more from Hillary Clinton than it took away from Donald Trump. An ironic moment because Bill Clinton largely wins in 1992 because Ross Perot drained 19% of the vote away, arguably more from George H.W. Bush than from him. In the state of Michigan, where Hillary Clinton loses by 10,704 votes, 223,000 votes were cast for the third party, either Gary Johnson or Jill Stein. In Wisconsin, where she loses by just 22,748 votes, the third parties take away 137,000. And in Pennsylvania, where she loses by 44,000 votes, the third parties take away 190,000. The argument made by two different political science studies is that those three states, if there was not the presence of a significant third party getting more than 1% of the vote, which has historically been the average of those parties, Hillary Clinton would have won all three of those states. Those states account for 46 electoral points, and as you know, would have been enough for her to win the election. It would have put Donald Trump at 260, 10 short of becoming the president. I want to make two additional comments before I move into the forecasting and then open it up to your disagreements or your questions. When you start to look towards the future about what's going to happen next, my argument, and I tried to make it when I was puncturing the myths earlier about this was a disaster election for the Democrats. It's going to have disastrous consequences for them, for sure, when it comes to these policy issues. But if you look at the numbers, they didn't do so badly. Pickups in the Senate and the House of Representatives, they win the popular vote by almost 3 million. Demographics are trending onto their side. Here are two key numbers that I think we need to look at. The first is that we're moving into cities 
at an incredible rate. And cities are becoming increasingly democratic. And the reason why the Republicans have now won in the last five elections, two elections where they lost the popular vote, is because small states have disproportionately more power than big states. So they're essentially 37 million people living in California. They have 55 points in the Electoral College. That means it takes two, it takes 670,000 voters for one electoral point if you live in California. In North Dakota, with a population of about 670,000 people, they have three electoral points. So for each point, it takes 218,000 people. What does that mean? If you live in North Dakota, you're three times more powerful than someone who lives in California when it comes to electing the president. Okay? You're not gonna see the Electoral College abolished. That's not gonna happen until you see an election where someone loses by 15 or 20 or 25 million. And then, there's because the small states, there are 26 small states in the United States, which make up 52% of our states, but only 13% of our population. So the small states are never gonna wanna get rid of the Electoral College. There's no momentum there for that. But the demographics, totally on the, Demo the Democrats' side. And so look at the Congress. What percentage of Republican members of Congress are white males? 88%. What's that number for the Democrats? 42%. And as you, the electorate changes demographically, that is going to be an incredible uh, symbol for voters. Second is education. What percentage of Americans have a master's degree? Do you know? Approximately. Five, very good guess. It's a bit higher than that, it's 10%. 10.30. So 10.30 in the United States have a master's degree. That's the average, okay? The three states I've lived in my life, I'm proud to say are the three most educated. Washington, D.C., 28%. Massachusetts, 16%, and Maryland, 13%. But of the 18 states that exist over that median line of 10.30, all 18 states voted for Hillary Clinton. So not only has the demographics changed, but as we become a more educated society, that obviously bodes well for the future of the Democratic Party. Right? Maybe that's the reason Nobody was at the inauguration uh, in Washington, D.C. Now, let's look at what's happening right now. There are five comments I want to make about what happens next for the Trump administration. And based on my experiences, I want to respond more to what you're interested in. Uh, I was lecturing on November 8th in the morning in Bangkok, Thailand, which was fascinating because at the time they were dealing, I was wearing a red, excuse me, a black ribbon for the death of their former king and there was this leadership transition that they were battling with, but they were also petrified about the withdrawal from the TPP. I rushed to the airport, flew back to Washington DC and voted just before the polls closed on November 8th and then flew to Moscow where I gave a lecture the day after on November 9th in Moscow. Fascinating situation because as I voted in Bethesda, Maryland, I don't spend much time in the United States so I actually didn't know where my polling station was, so I went to four different polling stations, and in not one polling station did I see a Trump yard sign or bumper sticker or volunteer outside of the polling station. In Moscow, on the other hand, <laughs> those Trump shirts are really popular. People coming up to me, and I'm talking about some of my liberal students, those that don't necessarily have a high approval of the current administration in the Russian Federation giving me huge hugs, like, you guys did it, thank you so much, tears coming down the eyes. You should read about some of these parties that they're having uh, in Moscow. Let's talk about this tribal politics in the United States right now. Among Democrats, someone guess what Donald Trump's approval rating is right now. It's 7%. And among Democrats, this is only Democrats, among Democrats, what is the approval rating of my university boss, President Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin? It's 8%. 
So in the Democratic Party, Putin is more popular than Donald Trump. Now let me shock you some even more. We have to talk about the Republicans. Among Republicans, when President Obama went off on his long-awaited vacation, what was his approval rating among Republicans, only Republicans? 8%. Among Republicans, Putin has a 35% approval rating. So Putin is over four times as popular as President Obama. Interesting, too, for those of you that followed developments in the Cold War uh, with that political party. As Obama would poke the Republicans before and after the election, Ronald Reagan would be turning over in his grave. Look at this administration right now. Some of you may ask questions about specific confirmations or, or what's going to happen. In terms of government experience, if you look at Bush and Clinton's administration, 81% of the cabinet appointments had had government experience. Now, as government gets more complex, how many people serve in the executive branch? Do you know? So that Trump is the titular head of this branch. 4.3 million people. And it keeps increasing. And so as the complications of governance in the executive branch has increased, you see more cabinets with even more government experience. So W. Bush had 91% with government experience, and Obama 91%. That number for Donald Trump is only 50%. When it comes to people who served as CEOs, the first Bush, 5%, Clinton, 14%, the second Bush, 18%. Obama had nobody who was a CEO on his first confirmation appointments, and Trump, 30%. PhDs, close to my heart. The first Bush, 19%, Clinton, 24%, the second Bush, 9%. Obama, 23%, almost one quarter of his cabinet had a PhD. Trump, zero. Right? Tough to get a job with, the, with a PhD these days, <laughs> which is actually true, by the way. For, for, the, for the Q students here, don't get a PhD. But the second thing that I forecast into the future, so the, my point here is you could see some challenges when it comes to management of departments. Obviously, we're looking at the DeVos uh, confirmation and uh, the Carson confirmation, Carson's main advisor, and even Carson himself intimated that he wouldn't take the human, uh, the, the health services cabinet nod because he didn't have the experience to do it. And then he was, and he's a renowned brain surgeon if you don't follow American politics. And so he said, I'm not qualified for that job, which then raised the question, why did you run for president then? <laughs> Yet he took the job for housing and urban development when he has almost no experience with that at all. So I think you're going to see some challenges with a very inexperienced cabinet. Secondly, you're going to see disruptions. On legislation, we're already dealing with the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, energy regulations, taxes, border security, infrastructure. We don't really know what to predict here. There's going to be a lot of volatility. And this is the same thing when it comes to global affairs. I was in Beijing just three weeks after the election. What's going to happen with Iran? What's going to happen with Cuba? What's going to happen with the placement of the embassy in Israel? What's going to happen with NAFTA, with Russia? If you ask somebody, except for Vladimir Putin, what's going to happen? If they say, I know, you should run away, right? Because I don't think the person that will be making this decision really knows what's going to happen on many of those issues. Third there's going to be a big impact, particularly when it comes to the federal courts. The average president in a four-year term gets 160 vacancies to fill at the district court, the appellate court, and the Supreme Court. On day one, on January 20th, there were already, for Donald Trump, were 117 vacancies. So just one day in, he had one-third of what a president usually has after four years. We already know we're going to have a titanic battle. He's narrowed it down essentially to two people for the Supreme Court. This is going to last, and this is what many never-Trumpers who ended up actually voting for Trump when there was nobody watching them in the booths, one of their justifications is this is going to affect policy 20, 30, 40 years down the road. And finally, the incredible weakness of Donald Trump. And this is going to lead uh, to another forecast that I'll make just like I made last year here in Doha. 
When Barack Obama entered office on January 20th, 2009, he had an 84% favorability rate. Now, after Donald Trump won, he saw a bump, right, this honeymoon period, but then after the transition started, it went back down the other way. And when Donald Trump took the oath of office, he had 32%, 52 points worse than Barack Obama. Now, Barack Obama's leaving is the most popular contemporary president. He beats out Eisenhower 60% to 58%, but his average approval rating over his eight years was only 47%. He entered at 84, he ended at 47. Donald Trump is entering at 32. This is 19 points worse than the worst ever rating to enter the Oval Office. And actually, that was Ronald Reagan who entered at 51%. But in that case, Ronald Reagan only had a 13% disapproval rating. So there was a 38% positive gap there. 30 something percent just didn't know what to think of the, the former actor and governor of California. They just didn't know. But with Donald Trump, opinion is known. Right? So that 51 to 32, 19 point gap, it's actually much bigger. He's probably, when you account for those numbers, 30 points worse than the worst ever approval rating coming in. And he also ran behind almost every single member of the Republican Party. Right? Weaker in contested states than in every state but two when it came to the United States Senate. So his leverage is limited. And it's also limited if you go back and you look at the Republicans actually wanted. Out of 17 candidates, what number choice was Donald Trump out of those 17? He was 17. <laughs> Ted Cruz, who finished in second place in that contest, a senator from Texas, could be the least popular senator in the history of the Republican Party. And I mean among Republicans. And yet, almost every Republican was choosing to endorse Cruz over Trump. You have a president who comes in, doesn't have much support. As a comedian said on Saturday, an entire gender protested against him, right? That change is usually only moved by groups of angry people. And if January 21st is any indication, there might be some change coming. You have somebody with a 32% approval rating who Republicans had to hold their nose for during the general election someone who has incredible business entanglements. One of my predictions, which as I was getting off the plane, I saw there was a viral story as a former cabinet member under Bill Clinton made the same prediction, so this is not uh, something new. There's already been a lawsuit that's been filed against Donald Trump by both Republicans and Democrats, ethics advisors from past administrations, constitutional law scholars, that makes the argument that his business entanglements are already against the Constitution. That at the first available moment that the Republicans have, that they will have an incentive to actually dump Donald Trump. And if the legal issues are in any way ambiguous or hazy, you will not see a defense made by his party. And that I would wager that there is probably a 50% chance that you could see in an impeachment and a successful conviction either right before or right after uh, the midterm elections. If it doesn't happen from his own party, as you may know from American history, incumbent presidents parties do really poorly. On average, they lose between 20 and 40 seats in the House of Representatives. But if you look at approval ratings, right now the Republican Party is slated, based on his approval rating, to lose between 50 and 70 seats. And so there's a good chance that after the 2018 congressional elections that he will be dealing with a Democratic Congress, both in the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. And it's clear that the Constitution says that you cannot benefit from foreign officials. Anybody who stays in the Washington, D.C., Trump Hotel, the numbers are released today. Not many people are staying there. It's almost just like the inauguration numbers. 
That is technically in violation, as a host of constitutional scholars say, of the United States Constitution. The question is will there be an incentive to go after that? Not quite sure about the Republicans, I give it a 50% chance, but if you look at the election prospects today, there's a very good chance that you would see this after the congressional elections. Thank you so much for dedicating your Wednesday night uh, to this, I think it's Wednesday, I don't know, I lost two days coming over here. Thanks to Fly America Act, by the way, I couldn't fly Qatar Airways, I had to fly United. Uh, and I really hope to return, and I wanna thank everybody here uh, for the hospitality. Appreciate it.